Hello, Byron Stripling. How are you doing? I'm doing good today in the quarantine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, an un unfortunate uh, reality for us artists these days. Well, well you I know what? You already said, though, uh, early today as I was listening to you talking, um, that there can be some advantages. Uh, there's that old saying that if God wants to give you a gift, he wraps it in a problem. And so I think that all of us are learning how to be creative. And I think that that's why you and I both stand here right now. Uh, we have the opportunity to talk because uh, you have more time and I've seen your schedule <laughs> and I have more time. So uh, this is a, maybe it's a, a blessing in disguise. And I think one of the things I want to try to do with this time that we're in quarantine is maybe the, the gift to me is I need to get off my behind and exercise more, which I've thankfully been doing, you know, um, and that's also inspired by you. Uh, one of the things I know that as busy as you are, I, I always note that you make time for your workout. And I have subtle, so many subtle appreciations for you and what you do, and that's one of them. And then, you know, the practicing thing, you're obviously a virtuoso, and I get to notice that too. So maybe this is my time to be like Sean Wallace. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I guess we don't need any more. We can we can enter the interview right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all the good stuff already. Um, Byron, why don't you tell uh, tell uh, tell our audience here uh, about yourself, where you're from, uh, where you grew up, and what your childhood was like? And yeah, yeah, and, and that's easy to do. It and I've always felt a little um, what do you call it? Um, nervous about talking about my childhood because it was so easy and so playful and so loving. Uh, you talk to somebody like my wife who wrote a book about her childhood and it makes a more interesting story than mine because she had a lot of hardship which she worked through in a triumphant way. Um, so I grew up, uh, we were born in Georgia and uh, we spent our days mostly in church. We were in church eight days a week, um, <laughs> you know, typically. <laughs> and that's probably why I don't go now, because I think I've checked my, my scheduler and I, I put my time in. <laughs> but uh, it was that was a, a, a glorious time for me. Now, here's and if there was I say it was a, a happy childhood. I later learned what we did and didn't have. And I think that's a testimony to being a parent. And I'm sure that you're like that. I've met uh, your beautiful son and uh, Moses. Right. Is his name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what a, a joy to watch him. And I know from the way that you raise him and the way he acts and responds is that you, he doesn't know, all he knows is that he's having a great time with you, throwing the ball, catching the ball with you. He did the same thing I did when uh, he ran, you run through the theater because you're a musician, so you're gonna be in the theater, you bring your son. You sit in every seat as a kid. You got to try every seat in the theater out. You got to <laughs> throw the ball. And you know, that's the way I grew up, just like Moses, your son. Um, when we got home, um, I told my mom at one point, I said, Mom, why don't you make beans and rice and um, potatoes and stuff like that anymore? Because that, you know, we used to eat really well. And she said, that's when we were poor. And she said, so I could always go buy a big sack of beans for, you know, a dollar. And I could always go get free scraps of the fat from the butcher. You can get, they'll just give that to you because they're trying to and put that in some collard greens and make the collard greens taste good. And so I always thought that we ate like kings when we started having steak and stuff. I didn't like it. You know, they would bring <laughs> ham and all that. I was like, go back to the beans and rice and the potatoes and the fresh baked breads that you used to make, you know? And that's what I'm doing now. It's like I'm baking. So I'm trying to stretch every dollar during the quarantine. So I'm, I'm baking fresh bread and just being my parents, you know. So that, look, that's all that stuff's all boring. I, I just say that to to say for parents, a lot of times you don't know what you are. I used to look in the cabinet and there was nothing in there and would wonder what were we going to eat that night? And my mother would make the best meal. So the creativity and the improvisation really comes from, in so many cases in the black tradition, comes from the mother who creates something out of nothing, who can make a meal for the family and all she got is a couple cans of beans up there and some onions and some garlic and she'll make a meal happen and you think you're a king. That's the way I grew up. Finally, musically the way that I grew up is my father was a classical singer and I think your father was a musician too. Was he full-time musician? 
He wasn't a full-time musician. Um, he actually, uh, let's see, he, he went to school uh, for music, and I think he changed his degree to like an engineering degree with, with music as a, uh, as a, as a minor. Um, but, uh, he, I mean, he sounded like Lou Donaldson. Wow. Uh, he was, he was a great saxophone player. I, I have some recordings of his playing, uh, re- really great player. And of course I was inspired by hearing him practicing around the house, which is why I wanted to play. And I got a lesson every day. Wow. I got a lesson every day. Um, and, uh, he had a very, very particular, uh, you know, idea about what I should be practicing, how I should be practicing it. And, um, it's because, uh, you know, to the extent that I listened to him, I, I developed quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And cause wow. he, he just, he just told me all the right stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, of course he, he, uh, did a master's degree in business administration and, uh, was a, uh, bureaucrat for, uh, state government in, in Michigan. Um, and he retired, uh, about the time I took the job at Ohio state, he, he retired and he just, he, these days he just does what he wants. That's what <laughs> he's supposed been, to do. Yeah. That's right. He, he, uh, he did the right things he was supposed to do with his money. And so now he does what he wants. He, uh, I grew up with horses and in the country and go-karts and four wheelers and all like that. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, is he proud of you? Uh, he's to, he's told me that, uh, but my dad is a very, he, he's the kind of person that, um, he doesn't tell me he loves me very often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He shows me he's always there. I can call him anytime. We can, mm-hmm. we can talk anytime. He's not, he's not big into, uh, 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 uh he's, he's not, uh, 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 uh soft talking. <laughs> he's, he's he's not very, very much into soft talking he's more into you know showing things by how he uh you know by he's the fact that he's always supportive he's always there any jam i ever got in he was always there i mean it's wow. it's just that kind yeah. of thing yeah well i have to say my father similar they come from that generation where the men were very quiet and i think quiet and i think stoic might be the word for for my dad uh However, similar to your dad, always there. Now, my dad never hugged me or said, I love you, until my mother died. And mm-hmm. then I think for him, he's like, well, I've got it. He was always comfortable in his role as the father, very quiet and that, and all that. And I think, you know, life makes you do things like this quarantine. And, and so he stepped up, and all of a sudden after my mother passed, uh, this is 20 years ago, my father, I met him at the airport, and, he gave me this big hug. I said, who is this? <laughs> you know, And he slapped me on the back. I love you, son. You know, it was one of those kind of things. And so he opened up in that way. Final story on that, because it's, it's nice to talk about personal stuff sometimes, too, because it uh, gives you sort of a feeling of who a person is. Um, I never really saw my father smile a lot. My father was not a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. He's just very serious. Uh, his work ethic, and, and I'd be interested in where you got your work ethic, because it's amazing to me. My dad's work ethic was was uh, could compare to any hardest work in the world. My picture of him when he got his doctorate was books spread all around the kitchen table. He was a, again a, a classical singer, but he was studying vocal pedagogy for his um, uh, doctorate, and that's the science of the voice. So he had to all, know also this medical stuff about the voice and all that kind mm. of stuff. And I would wake up maybe to get a glass of water at two, three in the morning as a kid, and my dad would still be studying. And all I remember is my mother saying, your dad got another A, your dad got another A, your hmm. dad got, I mean, he just worked his tail off. So that was uh, my thought about how one was supposed to live his life is just, you don't sit around. And he always told me, he says, you know, son, we're a working family. We don't sit around, you know, yeah, we, yeah. we get to work, you know? So yeah. that was, that was the way I was brought up with two amazing people. My mother, died of cancer, um, you know, again, like probably 25 years ago, breast cancer, and I lost her early, and I never thought I could live a life without my mother. Um, but then my father, again, I said, stepped up in, in, in an amazing way. And then also at the same time, uh, my mother passed, I'd met my wife, which has, she's nurtured me and turned me into, I think, the, the person I am today, in addition to my parents. So I've been very lucky that way. 
Yeah, you know, my uh, my dad was also a very hard worker, um, and he expected uh, and, and expects, you know, us to be that way. Um, maybe the the greatest thing I learned from my dad was not to make excuses because mm. he wouldn't li- he wouldn't allow us to make excuses. Um, I remember. Uh, so, you know, I grew up in the country and we had two acres and we had horses and there was a lot of stuff to a lot of work to do in the yard. And uh, I remember one time uh, me and my brother, uh, my brothers, we, we came back in the house because it was raining out. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad said, why are you inside? You, the work's not done. And I said, it's raining. He says, he said, you guys are waterproof. Go back out there. You know, uh, so <laughs> uh, one time we, we dug a, a dry well. And uh, me and my, my older brother, we dug this dry well. And it was, uh, I, I can't remember how many feet, at least eight feet deep. And, you know, it was a big cube, you know. Um, and then we put all these rocks in it. And it's just uh, really, really uh, a lot of labor associated with that, um, taking care of horses and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But um, the thing I wanted to do most when I was growing up was, was and this is totally weird, uh, was play, it was practice. That was yeah, the thing I wanted to do most. Yeah. And, um, uh, but, you know, we had a real rounded, you know, kind of a uh, lifestyle, my my mom was a spiritual kind of uh, leader of the house. Um, and so she would take us to church and my dad instilled a, a real kind of uh, discipline and in, in structure. Uh, I started doing, uh, we, all of us were doing exercises before we went to bed every night. I can't remember how early that started. Was uh, that mandatory or by choice? Uh, no, 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 that was mandatory. Uh, all of us had to do setups, pushups, um, there was a couple other variations of those exercises that we did every night before we went to bed. Um, uh, and that was just, that was, that was what it was. Uh, so that, I think that, that whole expecting that it's time to work, no excuses, let's get it done. Uh, it definitely comes from my dad all the way. Yeah. Well, the way. I've always, I've always wondered about that work ethic. And then did you, in terms of your training, you know, for your body, did that come from your dad? Is that something that you then crescendoed into doing yourself? You know? Yeah, you know, um, honestly, I think the all of the weight training and bodybuilding and all that stuff that that was a sort of logical outflow of the expectation to be doing physical activity, um, uh, exercising, some kind of regular uh, training. My you know training my body. I just got I got used to that. I think part of the reason that my dad in particular wanted me to be doing setups and push-ups and things was because there's a direct connection between abdominal strength and mm-hmm. diaphragmatic strength, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so producing a good sound and having a lot of endurance when, when you're playing, uh, producing a big sound, you know, all of that stuff uh, is directly related to lung capacity and the, your ability to uh, to control the diaphragm, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, I think what really got me into the weight training was, you know, me and my best friend growing up, uh, uh, Anthony Woodcock, uh, he lived, uh, uh, I don't know, about a mile and a half away from my house. So I could ride my mm-hmm. bike over to his house and, uh, he, uh, him, me and him, we were all about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lee Haney. That got was, it. it's all about, it was all of that. And part of it I think was about trying to impress girls yeah honestly you know yeah oh we started when we were 13 or 14 yeah and uh and then we just kept doing it um and it was just something then we started hanging out around training and in high school and stuff yeah so that's always been something that's been um uh part of you know part of my life Mm -hmm. so the the weight thing that's part of your identity now so does it are there times or when do you know when to take a day off and when to chill out for a bit or do you always do something? Well, I mean, you you know, I, I tell folks, you know, you have to listen to your body, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with an injury, you have to either, 
you have to take enough time to recover from the injury and or you have to learn how to train around the injury. Mm -hmm. um, and um, weight training for me is quite therapeutic. This has been pretty challenging not being able to go to the gym mm -hmm. uh, because it's a way that I, uh, you know, I deal with stress. It's and a stress thing, yeah. yeah. And, and all of that. Um, yeah. And the times in my life when I haven't been able to train regularly, mm -hmm. um, uh, I've always noticed that I was more stressed, you mm -hmm. know, um, and I had a harder time just dealing with uh, just certain things. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely an important thing. Now I'm doing some things in, in the house, um, some body weight stuff, push-ups, set-ups, mm -hmm. pull-ups, you know, there's a bunch of other things. Um, you know, I have some right. bands so I can do some resistance right. kind of training. Um, but, yeah. So, uh, final question from me for you. Is the pull-up the hallmark of the thing I've always been? Because I can't do a pull-up. I mean, can you, you can do pull-ups? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, stop yeah. laughing at me. <laughs> You're still laughing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I can do, I can do pull-ups. Um, do you think that that's like one, because... I don't even know how to begin that process, or maybe I need to lose more weight before I get there. But uh, I, I, I think I think pull-ups. Uh, uh, so at the gym, they have these machines. Uh, it's called a gravitron. And help or, you. Yeah, right. So yeah. It, it'll it'll provide some assistance, and so uh, I mean, oh, you know, you just have to stick to it. Um, yeah. Providing assistance, and then less assistance, less assistance until you can do it yeah. by yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my son, I have my son, my son is six yeah, yeah. and he does exercises every night. For, for wow. Yeah. So he, he does push ups, set ups. Um, he does dips. Um, and he does what we call muscle legs, but it's really <laughs> just, it's just squats basically. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, we have, a, I've got a pull up bar that you can put in a door in the doorway yeah. And yeah. then I lift him up so that he can do it. And he does 10, 10 inside grip like this, yeah. and then 10 like this. Wow. But, yeah. you know, it's it's heavily assisted. I'm, I'm, I'm assisting him. He can yeah. do about three pull-ups by himself. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it is all, you know, I'm, I'm you know. And he yeah. has a good time doing it, so. Yeah. So did that discipline transfer into, if you don't mind me asking you about, because I've just always been impressed with, with you being a virtuoso like you just didn't happen. So did the discipline of weightlifting and training transfer that discipline transfer into music for you or was it the other way around maybe? Um I I I actually think it's something else that fed into both of those, maybe. Okay. Um but I'm not I it it, it it's it's hard to know. Um I I wasn't born disciplined, you know, uh, nobody is. Um, uh, my dad had specific regimen that he, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to do it. And there and, was no, you couldn't say, I'm, I don't think I want to do that it, with him. And you just like, you, you, you had to do it. My, I mean, that's the way my dad was like, certain it, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it was, we didn't, there was no back talking and there was yeah. no, you know, uh, you know, and the thing is, is that I think as we earned his respect, yeah. then we could start to have conversations about what it was that we were trying to do. And and he knew so much about us, uh, all of his kids. I mean, I'm the only musician. My my sister's a psychiatrist. Um, my older brother is a is a computer engineer, you know, uh, um uh, he designs a uh, pro computer programmer. Uh, yeah. My younger brother is a military guy. Mm -hmm. So he didn't push us all in the same direction. Yeah. You know, he, he knew what it was, you know, based on the different things that he tried with us. And mm -hmm. then he said, okay, well, if this is what you want to do, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to do halfway. If, if yeah. this is what you're trying to do, then let's do it. You know, yeah. it was that kind of approach. Yeah. Right. Was there a weirdness about having that strong of a personality 
uh, as your father? Did you push back at all? Uh, I think when, when I became a teenager, I think we, um, I, I think just what's normal as you're becoming a, an adult, you start to, um, you're trying to figure out how you measure up against things and there's, you know, there's resistance. Um, and so certainly, uh, you know, there's no, there's, I, I don't think it's much different than probably what most people experience. Sure. Yeah. Um, good stuff. So, it's good to find out about your family, man. Well, let's let's find out more about Byron Stripling. Um, so, why did you decide to become a musician? I know you're, you, like you said, your uh, your dad was a was a singer. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't really, uh, and I've struggled with this with my own children because I always knew what I wanted to do. So. Come fourth grade, uh, they say, you know, what instrument do you want? And I said, I think I want to play trumpet. And my dad bought me a trumpet. Now, when you think about that, that's pretty stupid because kids change on a dime. Like next week, they say, well, I really want to play sax. And the next week, I really want to play the drums, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but my dad, and, and, and I did know in making that choice that my dad was like, you're, you're going to trump, I'll get you a trumpet. And, that's going to be your instrument. It's not like going, we're not going to have a dance on this thing, you know? Right. So um, dad was always, I, I mentioned he was a, a classical musician and my days were filled with, with uh, classical music in the morning. <clears throat> but as soon as my father got home from work, then it was all about jazz. So it was Louis Armstrong, it was Miles Davis. There's two records he loved, Miles in Europe and Four and More. I don't think my dad knew how progressive that was. He just knew he liked it, you know? Um, right. Then he loved Duke Ellington and um, Clark Terry, Count Basie he loved, just the more traditional. But Miles, for some reason, he, he got, Miles got his ear and he loved Miles. So I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm like, you know, I like that Louis Armstrong and I like that Miles Davis stuff and I like all these things. The other thing he did um, and which is, you know, something that's going to be interesting if we think where we are now with this quarantine and the way music is going to be brought to people is my dad felt real strongly about live music. So when I was a kid, I heard Beverly Sills, Marilyn Horn. I heard Leontine Price. I heard Ella Fitzgerald. The opening act was Roy Eldridge, Eddie Lockjaw, Davis, Tommy Flanagan, Keita Betts, and, and who was on drums? Bobby Durham was on drums. And I about lost myself because I had been listening to these records even as a kid, and I would read the back of them. Uh, they took us to see Sarah Vaughan. I saw Duke Ellington twice. I saw Count Basie's band probably 10 times. Um, and there's so many more. My parents were teachers, school teachers. They didn't make a lot of money, but they believed in putting money down to buy tickets to see huh. live music. And, and it affected me. It got in my blood. It got in my DNA. And there was never any doubt in my mind that that's what I would be doing, you know? So my, my dad put together shows. He was a, a conductor. He conducted choirs. He wrote music for a chamber orchestra behind our gospel choir. This is in 1972. He did this. He found the best musicians in Minnesota from the St. Paul chamber orchestra, which is a world renowned chamber orchestra. He hired those guys at this, to play at this black Baptist church. And those cats, he, he did, we did first half, this is my dad, classic father, first half classical music, second half gospel, you know? And the, the classical music was all sung in Latin and it was a full black choir singing all Latin, Santus, De, Demi News, all that kind of stuff. My dad knew pronunciation was his thing. So he could, he taught Man. us all the correct, you know, we did the Schubert Mass in G and all, I mean, just all kind of stuff. And I'm in this and I'm going, um, this is me. Like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what, so, uh, you know, I mentioned I've had conflict because my daughters both went into college with no knowledge of their major. Like, what are you guys going to major in? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, and then my wife is like, that's what kids do. Like, like they don't, you knew what you want to do. You always knew that. Not everybody's like you. I'm like, but you gotta have a major. Like, you gotta know, and then you gotta start working towards these goals. And and I'm like, sit down, relax, big guy. You know. And so, what? Uh, and 
you're a teacher in a in a in a school. You know what what kids go through with this. Just trying to make those choices. You know. Yeah, I was I was the same way. I I knew uh, people asked me from when I started. I started when I was six, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, anytime somebody asked me what did I wanted to be, I tell them I want to be a world class musician. Wow, would you say it like that? But, yeah, that was the, that was the only thing I wanted to do. That, that's that was fantastic. It. But that, you would say a, world class. I want to be a world class musician. That I was wish my... you would have been my teacher. I would have started. Uh... <laughs> you know, I think the things that come out of your mouth, and I work with this with my students, is uh, you just be careful what you say and say if you say it like that, then that's that helps where you're going. You know, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, yeah, that's good language. Yeah, and and you know, I'm 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 sure I didn't invent those words. I'm sure my dad had some. <laughs> some yeah. hand in in giving me those words to crafting those words but but that was that was the the thing and uh yeah you know and I look at my son who is 6 that's when mm-hmm. I started when I was 6 and and it makes me realize how weird I was yeah. um because I see the kinds of things that he wants to do um yeah. and the sort of all over the place you know, with interest, and that's that's more normal. That's um, and and it's okay, and it's okay. He doesn't need to. I don't need to um, make him do mm-hmm. anything. You know, you yeah. just you just have a good time doing what you're doing right now. If you if you tell me that you're going to do something, mm-hmm. and then then we're going to do it. But right. but if you know, I'm not going to. You know, I I was talking to um, a buddy of mine uh, who has kids, a uh, great musician. And and he has wrestled with the whole idea of if he wants his kids to even be musicians, mm-hmm. because it's a it's a uh, being a musician is 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 challenging. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a hard thing to do. Now I'm I'm stuck with it. I would be miserable without it. Mm-hmm. It's the only thing I ever wanted to do. I would be lost without it. Uh, all of that. Um, but there's no sense in forcing someone to do something. Uh, you know to be a musician because I'm a musician, mm-hmm. you Absolutely. know, like yeah. you're going to, you're going to follow in the family in you know, in the family legacy, you're going to, yeah. you're going to do what I did. You know, there's no sense in doing that. Uh, yeah. So. I mean, uh, I sort of have a formula for, uh, people in regard to being a musician. And I, it's, it's comes from my, my wife's father, who was uh, just an amazing man, but he used to say, um, if you can think of anything else you want to do other than be a musician or an artist, then do that, because being a musician is going to take a thousand percent. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so, you know, oh yeah, oh yeah. You want to diddle with computers and stuff like that, you know? Um, do you know that's if that's your thing? If you want to just play around with some other stuff, but the musician thing, if you're going to do that, if you're going to make a living at that and make that a profession, you have to go a hundred percent at it. The other thing he used to say is. Um, be so good that they can't deny you. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's something I try to, to help people. I don't know that if I, if, if I've gotten to that level yet, but that'll help you in a, in a job interview or any, in any interaction, because it's something that's unspoken. You don't tell people how good you are. You sit down and you do the job and they're like, mm-hmm. okay, like we need to have this guy. Um, and that's how you'll keep your job, and that's how you grow in your job if you're, you know, involved in constantly improving yourself and making yourself better. But it's got to be that kind of thing, uh, and and that's the struggle when you're teaching people, and there are fewer and fewer opportunities as a musician. Then you just got to be the best cat out there. They have to give the job to you because right. you're so. I think so. You have to have that 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 thought of I have to be outstanding I have to be excellent I have to be extraordinary I have to do the things that the ordinary guys wouldn't do I have to be superlative I have to do all these things and when you walk in a room and honestly there's a racial element to that that's also important too and it's unfortunate that it is but that that uh, sometimes black men have to really uh, double their uh, abilities just to be recognized. And, yeah, and yeah, I just have to yeah. say that, you know, and I know it's not the politically correct thing to say, um, but that's that's the way I feel about it. 
Yeah, it's a, yeah, right. The the belief that the the black musician has to be twice as you know twice as good to get the same gig that yeah. the white uh, counterparts uh, are well, white counterparts. You, this yeah. is a difficult discussion. I mean, because yeah. I've always always told that by my father and in reading psychology books, it's really unfair to do that to to black men. Um, but it's kind of a reality. Um, right. So I, I don't want to get too deep into that because it's a whole other thing. But uh, we are aware of it, folks. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> all right to it. say, it's all right to say what's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. What uh, what projects have you worked on? Bands have you played in, and which were your favorite, and why? Well, geez, I have to reach back a ways. Uh, um, I have a. I wish I could provide a link for you because there's probably a two minute link of this thing I did. So I was very much influenced by Thad Jones as a kid. Uh, my father, we'll go back to him, used to drop me off at a place called the Prom Ballroom. We lived in St. Paul, Minnesota. Every big band went through there. The booking agency, Willard Alexander, I later learned about them, would run everybody through there on off nights, this ballroom. It was always four-hour gigs. So I saw Buddy Rich, Woody Herman, Count Basie a trillion times, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band. I was in high school, but they would let you come in there and you could sip a Coke. It was $5 to get in. So my dad would give me a $5 bill and a dollar for you know a Coke or whatever I was drinking back then. And you could stand right up on the bandstand. So, you know, that that was a important thing to me. So I heard Thad's band and I used to visit with those guys on the break as a little kid. And so I'd see Thad and talk to him. Then later when I joined the Count Basie band, he was the first official leader after Count Basie passed away. And he's like, aren't you that little kid that used to, I see in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, that was a cool thing. Well, he wrote a whole show for a singer in Germany named Katarina Valente, and she was a huge star in, in, in Germany. So we did a three-week tour in Germany with all music written by Thad Jones. Uh, he'd recorded an album before that of all those charts. He wrote more charts, and we did a two-hour show every night. We only played two band numbers, and then we did all his new arrangements for the Basie Band and Katarina Valente. John, this was the kind of gig, and Dennis McCraw was playing drums, and that's part of what made it. He and Thad had a connection that was kind of like Mel and Thad had. Um, and, so, and I remember we played the show the first night, and the second night, Dennis put his music stand to the side and played the whole show for memory. That's the kind of genius he was. He's an amazing musician. And it was like we would get, we'd play the gig, and I'd be on fire. Thad also had cancer at that time, so he would conduct the gigs, and his cancer was prostate cancer. And I remember his wife, these are all stories I've never told anybody. His wife said to me after we came back from the break, he, she said, because I, I followed Thad like a little puppy anyway, and I sat by him on the bus and everything. Uh, she said, when Thad comes back from our break, she didn't tell me what was going on. She says, could you help him with his luggage? I said, yeah, of course, you know, and, and help him with anything he needs and just make sure he's eating right. And I said, I didn't think anything of it. I was 20 three years old, you know, and yeah, whatever that needs, you know, I got, it, you know, um, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that he was exhausted after the concerts, but he would stand and conduct. So the music, like, like his thing as a conductor was so great because he made you play better from his conducting. See, the secret of leadership to me is that everybody's better because you showed up. Uh, it's not because uh, of, of any other thing is that you have a feeling, a way of bringing people together. Um, oh. And then the musicians have a respect for you, hopefully. But there was something magical about Thad's hands. Like you could, and I've talked to Earl Gardner, the trumpet player that, that used to play in the uh, Thad's band as lead trumpet. Thad could get you energy. He'd look at you and go, ha, like that. And you'd go, like, it's like electricity jumped through your body, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you could play stuff you didn't think you could play. Um, and also there was this spontaneity on stage, which he was able to to get. Quick story on that. I asked Dick Oates, you know, how was your first night on the, the uh, great alto sax player, Dick Oates, uh, playing with Thad? He goes, uh, he goes, yeah, he goes, everything was so improvised and within the, the context of a big band and Thad would do anything. Stop the band, and one guy would just play totally solo with nobody 
but take it out. Like we wouldn't know where anything was. And Thad had a way of just magically making things together. I said, well, what do you do that night with you? Well, we got to a certain part. It was my first night on the band. We were playing a blues. Thad handed me the mic. I thought he wanted me to stand up and solo. He wanted me to sing courses of the blues. <laughs> And that was that. He had Dickos <laughs> on this scat, you know. <laughs> and but that was the spontaneity. It's that, you know? That's great. <laughs> yeah, just give you the mic, sing, man, you know. <laughs> and that's that's bad, you know. Um, but that that tour was one of the highlights. It's still, it's it's probably over thirty years ago of my life because I would get on the bus and I couldn't wait to play. You know how you have those nervous shake in your leg? It was like that on because I could not wait. The music was so great. It felt so good. And I was like, this is, I'm living the dream at 23 years old, you know? And there are recordings of this. It was, he wrote a Stevie Wonder medley. He arranged the corniest tune. You know that tune, Don Kushun, my dear Don Kushun. It's the corniest little, the Germans love that, you know? And he, his arrangement was like a gift. Like it was, it was amazing. So. I mean that just is one thing that 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 comes to me as a pivotal time in my life when I realized the power of the music where people came to that concert they didn't even realize those arrangements all swung but they were so harmonically complex but they didn't the audience that had a way of delivering swing and power to an audience as well as the intellectual stuff that's not off you don't often hear these days the integrity of the music was never sacrificed, um, but it always was had that Count Basie thing, pat your foot. You could always pat your foot to it, but yet the, the, the arrangements were complex and and they had there was something about them that, that was magical. So that stands out as one pivotal period or, or you know, part of music for me. Yeah. Um, what musicians have been inspirational to you in your work? Well, I mean, I talked about Thad. I'll say a quick thing. With, with with Thad, we jammed every night. The old guys were a little like, ah. But me and Dennis McCrell, the older tenor player, Kenny Heen, who's gone, and uh, a couple other guys, wherever we were, Dennis would bring his brushes and a sheet of paper. And Thad was still playing, you know, back then. And we would just sit and play tunes. And Thad... He told me the, the greatest thing, because I would play two courses and stop. And he said, uh, man, you got to play like four or five courses, man. I was like, why? He goes, because then you get all that crap out that you always play, and then you start improvising. You know, so, so get get that stuff out of you, get your licks out, and I need you to then start improvising. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> and the jam sessions were formal. They weren't, they were like, they weren't like lessons. It was just catch jamming, but Fad would pull me aside and always, he was just like a mentor. So there were so many things that he did for me. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie was another one. Um, I, uh, I did Dizzy's big band courtesy of uh, uh, John Faddis. I, I have to tell you a quick story about that one. This is all stuff I never tell people. This was funny. So I got a call from his uh, the office that was booking him. It was a festival productions, big company. And, and uh, they did all the jazz festivals everywhere in the world. So uh, they said, uh, yeah, Dizzy and the guys, they want you to play in the trumpet section, his big band for the tour, and I'll make up a number. It, it pays uh, $500 a week, and everybody's getting that, and that's what the money is. And I went, really? And she goes, yeah, that's what it is. And so you are you in? And I go, how am I going to say no to Dizzy? You know, so, yeah, I'm in, you know. So the first day I get on the bus, you know, that was I was probably 24 by then, you know. Basically, guys, let me take a leave to do the summer festivals. And uh, got on the bus and said, man, this is a great gig. All these great musicians. Uh, Sam Rivers was the sax, the sax player on the on the band, you know, because he was in Dizzy's uh, band at the time, the quartet or quintet. Uh, I said, man, this is a drag, man. They got us all out here making $500 a week. And, and that's a drag. Why would they do that? And everybody started laughing at me. And I'm like, what's the, why y'all laughing? He said, man, you have to tell people what you want. Don't you don't accept the first offer. They're going to tell you, they'll tell you anything. They'll tell you we're all getting $300 and you're going to take, 
He says, you have to set your own. But so that was a good lesson for me playing, playing with that band. Um, so that was a first big tour with Dizzy. But um, Fattest, when I moved to New York, he took me under his wing. He took me out to eat uh, every night, uh, made sure I was fed, him and Lou Soloff, because uh, I kind of hadn't known those guys from the road. And um, so I did the tour with Dizzy's big band. And, and Fattest, like I say, we, when we when I was in New York, we would always go wherever Dizzy was playing. Me and John, John would take me. Hey, Dizzy, remember Byron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we got to be friendly. Then we did a tour with Billy Eckstein, Dizzy, and the Basie Band. Because I went right back to the Basie Band. And so that's where I really developed this great relationship with, with Dizzy. Because I was responsible really for basically me and, and Johnny Williams. I don't know if you met Johnny, uh, the baritone player of the Count Basie Band. Mm. Um, we all, Johnny and I basically took care of Dizzy. Because he would get in his room and his clothes and his stuff would be everywhere. But I hang with, hung with Dizzy 24 7. It was like knock on his door in the morning. We'd hang, you know, he'd smoke a joint and then we'd go eat breakfast, you know. And people would walk up to the table as we were eating breakfast. Because you have to remember, this is the end of Dizzy's life. Everybody who was, you know, anybody in, that had been living knew who Dizzy was. They knew his face. They knew that's the guy that puffs his cheek. They might know his, might not know his name, but they know that's the guy with the cheeks, you know? And so we'd be at breakfast and people would walk by and they'd do a double take and they'd come back and they'd say, excuse me, sir, are you Dizzy Gillespie? And he'd look up at him and they'd say, you mean to tell me as ugly as Dizzy Gillespie is, you think I'm Dizzy Gillespie? <laughs> he would say that. And the guy would be embarrassed. He goes, man, I'm just joking. I'm, yes, I'm Dizzy Gillespie. But that was his humor. He was always messing with people like that. That's where I got really close with Dizzy during that period of time. But the weird thing about that is we rarely talked about music. We just talked mm -hmm. about life. We talked about girls all the time. We talked about musicians because he always had... You know, there was a trumpet player. Boy, nobody heard of him, but he could play his tail off. And yeah, I get these stories about that. I couldn't lean him towards Charlie Parker because he didn't want to go there. I think that was um, I think that was a, a hard one for him because I was always interested to get him to tell me something about Bird. But I think there was a, a scar. I think he, he thought he left this world too soon, which he did. Oh, yeah. And I think that uh, towards the end, Bird missing so many gigs caused you know a, a thing between them because Dizzy, no matter how crazy he was, you know he made time. He was always the, the first or second guy on the bus, and he believed in you know hitting your mark when you're supposed to hit it. He had discipline like that, and it really messed with him when Bird would miss all these gigs, and then Dizzy left holding the the bag. People were like, I hired Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. And they weren't making any money back then, but it's just embarrassing to have to come up with another excuse. So Dizzy never wanted to go down that path of talking about, um, you know, that. But wherever we were, Dizzy would call, like, we spent two days with Gerald Wilson, the great conductor, whenever in Los Angeles. It'd be me, Dizzy, Gerald Wilson in a room, and I just listened to two old guys talk and just blow my mind. Um, so that was a really important part of my life, just to learn what kind of person he was. The only thing, I, I'm talking too much, but the only thing I say about Dizzy is one time we just played Night in Tunisia every night and all the trumpet players had to play. And Dizzy took the last solo. And he would always kick our behinds even though he was already in his 70s. And he would play the, uh, uh, a break. We would do the, the interlude for the break for him. And every night different. And I said, Dizzy, every night you it's different, man. Like I can never come... And he said, and it was very simple. He said, well, there's so much to play. And my thing is like, well, I learned this lick, so I'm going to play it during the break. And his thing is like, it's unlimited. Like, there's no, you could do whatever you want. He goes, that's four bars where you can take it anywhere. And my thing was like, man, I just want to try to get through these, you know. So he taught me to, to, to try to stretch, which I'm still trying to learn today. And I apologize for that that long recitative. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's 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 why I have you on here. I want we want to hear this. Um, uh, so, when I was uh, a kid, um, and all the way up through high school, and when I was in college, 
I had a lot of time to practice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but now, you know, that I, uh, that I'm, you know, I have a mortgage and a wife and a son and, um, and responsibilities and everything else, uh, there's not nearly as much time to practice. And so I have to be a lot more specific about what it is that I practice and I'm still trying to cover ground, you know. And so often I wonder uh, what other, you know, musicians are, uh, you know, because, you know, if you're anything like like my journey has been, I don't practice the same things that I used to practice. Mm -hmm. Some of them I do. Uh, some of the fundamental things I, I always go back to, but I'm always trying to climb. I'm still trying to climb this mountain and I can't keep, you know, spending time going back to the bottom of the mountain every mm -hmm. time if I'm trying to cover ground. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is what, what do you practice and, um, uh, and how do you, how do you manage the limited time that we all have to practice? Right. Um, well, for me, I think clarity is power finding out what my weaknesses are, and I'm very aware of them. Uh, people would probably say, boy, he's full of arrogance. I'm not. I'm very insecure about, especially about my weaknesses. And so I like to have my practice inform those and inform which way I'm going, be clear about where those are. Um, trumpet, as I feel, is a little bit different. Um, you know, Dizzy used to talk about how unforgiving the trumpet is, and you practice it like hell, and then you die, and then the trumpet wins. That was always his, <laughs> that was always his joke, you know. <laughs> In the end, the trumpet is going to win anyway. So there's you're talking about like there's basic stuff that trumpets, and and this is where a lot of guys get lost because they can get routine itis. They they have a routine that they play that keeps their chops strong but it doesn't make them better. So you make a good point. So how can I get to the point where I do, do a warm up, do some long tones, get some things going, and then pretty quickly after that, get to the stuff that I suck on. One thing that we always talk about is, um, is a philosophy, it's called eat the frog first. And that philosophy is if, if you were told, hey man, there's a piece of chocolate cake there, some fried chicken and some whatever stuff you like, but there's also a frog there. Uh, which one would you eat first? Well, the frog is the one that you hate. It loves, you've got to eat a raw frog or something. So eat the frog first and then you can. Do, so I do that with my practice the most difficult stuff first. I think that's a time saver for you. So like with my students, I put an X. We've got these uh, chord things that we play of all the chords and stuff. It, I don't need you to. You just nailed C major. I need you to go right to F sharp. I need you to go huh, right, right, deep right, flat. Right, right, right. I need you to eat the frog first because that's the one. But it's tricky because, see, we, we want to make ourselves happy by sounding good when we practice. You know, somebody said that they, and, and that's impressive. Look, check me out. And, and and by the way, if you're practicing like at OSU or something, maybe some people in the hall go, boy, Byron sure does sound good. You know, somebody told me they were in an apartment and there was a trumpet player that always sounded bad just they would hear this guy seeing, like, working through stuff and something and they found out that trumpet player was freddie hubbard and it makes so much sense you know because mm -hmm. freddie had that kind of facility he was all there's no way he could have played that way and were and let if he was working through some stuff you know right. and eating the frog first so that i think can kind of give some clarity clarity to where I try to, to do, do more now in my life because I had to teach myself how to practice. Sometimes teachers don't know. My Some of my teachers weren't good pedagogues, if you want to call it. Um, so I kind of had to teach myself and ultimately I think we all have to kind of end up teaching ourselves what works for us in our particular way of practicing. So probably not a good answer, but I'll Oh no, that's a great, no, this is a great answer. Um, and uh, how do you see yourself in the future? What what goals do you have, and what unfinished projects, and and maybe even uh, personal growth? You know, things that mm -hmm. might not even necessarily be related to music. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the personal growth one is a good one because I I 
I've been thinking about a lot of this recently because now we're in this quarantine and I did traditionally have a, a, you know, things that I practice, but it actually, the focus has shifted. Is it possible that music could, could bring some healing to this world? And I think the, the answer is always yes, but you know, what would that music be? When the quarantine is over, we have to realize, and this is the thing that I think people actually are afraid to think about. Everything will be different when we go back. The fact that you and I are talking remotely, the fact that people are teaching remotely, the fact that I'm gonna you know, start some, uh, hopefully some remote, some kind of concert things closer to when the whole thing, people are able to go to concerts, that all comes in. I mean, people are, are people going to watch music like they watch Netflix? We don't know. There's a possibility that happens, you know. So it's a good to just in terms of anticipation of career growth and also what the world is going to be. But I think that there will be a longing for people to come together. And I think that music could provide that bridge for people. That there's power... You know, I always like to say that, you know, great music can uh, make you cry when there's nothing sad. You know, it can make you laugh when there ain't nothing, no jokes. It can, right. it can just make you feel good. It also has the power to make you run when there ain't nobody behind you. It's just great stuff. I always listen to, to music when I work out, you know, because it, it feeds me. There's something in the world that now more than ever, ever, we're going to need some great music. And I hope that I can provide that for some people. So that would be a long range goal for me with the distinct knowledge that the way that music will be delivered in the future will not be uh, the same. The, the people will come to live concerts, but let's go to reality once again. If they say in, I have my own projections, August or later that people, hey, it's cool to start going to live concerts. Would you go? I don't know that I would. I don't know if I'd feel ready in August to go to concerts because yeah. I don't know where where the guy, I mean, I had to just look at myself. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. I know my wife would, won't let me go to the store now. <laughs> She's like, get that stuff delivered, you know, because she's trying to protect her family and me and everything else. And she, she lays out her case and, and I have to push back or let, you know, so are you gonna three months later uh, sit next to a guy and he has <coughs> he goes like that and you freak out and you don't know what so and the, by the way i've talked to people who own the theaters and that's what they're saying it's going to be later than any of us think so how can i deliver i mean i'm probably digressing from your question how can i deliver him because people being away from live music that long is going to affect them then that begs the question how do you better communicate your music um, through video and those type of things? Right. What, you know, you've got the great microphone. I don't, we've got, you know, how, how does that line up? And then what is that music going to be? I, I, I don't have prejudice with music. Everything doesn't have to be jazz for me. And, you know, I believe like Kierkegaard said, once you label me, you negate me. And I think we can get in trouble, especially after so much time it's, has gone by in the history of mankind we can get in trouble with saying well i only play this type of music jazz is my favorite type of music but i'm not afraid of any other type of music having an organic influence in me and i'm not a one that is dogmatic enough to say that that's the only great music and i don't think that i can play every kind of music but if there are influences that organically come into what i do I want to honor those, and I feel that they can, can bring life to whatever music I end up creating. So those that's part of my goal. I play music for people, and I want to uplift them, bring joy in their lives through that. And sometimes it's from what I play, from what I sing, even from what I might say. If I can make somebody laugh, you know, there's a student, Mahalia Jackson used to sing, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. I used to love that because that's kind of, and my mother loved that song too. And I understand why now, because all we have is each other. 
Yeah. And I think it's for us to de deliver the divineness that music has in it, the joyous qualities that it has to people, especially instrumental music, because then there's no chance of a political agenda or something getting the lyrics won't even get in your way. Right. I was right. in uh, Pittsburgh talking to a, a to their donors. Actually, it was in Florida. I did some concerts and they have a retreat uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony. Uh, down there and their donors come down there and do a whole thing. So I, I worked with them or talked with them for an hour, getting people's impressions of music. And one of their donors said, um, I asked about your favorite concert, your favorite musical experiences. And he said, he said, you know, I'm a very religious man, but he says, I think I've gotten more religious experiences in the concert hall, listening to Beethoven and Brahms and those people than I have at church. You know, he goes, and I don't know why that is. And I made the comment, maybe that was wrong. But I said, maybe you didn't have this space of words and somebody preaching to you about something that you just felt that the music went right from the player to your heart. And that's the experience that you got from them. Mm. You know, wasn't somebody preaching to you and and you actually, because this is what used to happen to me. See, now I'm getting, I shouldn't go here. But, you know, I knew what the preacher was doing behind the pastor study <laughs> and he was preaching something different in the pulpit. So that was a tough one for me, but yeah. the music always got me. Yeah. I always felt good with the music because you know, that, 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 that blockage of, of the, the, this guy on, on the pulpit was one thing, but the music always went straight to my heart, you know, and, and lifted me up. And I, and I saw how my grandparents were influenced by, I, I, I'll stop talking in one second, but I remember my, you know, we went to one of them holy roller churches and my grandmother used to fall out and shout like that, you know, and, and I would ask my mom, I was like, what, you know, what's up with grandma? Why is she, why is she doing that all the time? <laughs> and, right, you said, and then she told me the history of my grandmother. And first she would say, well, she's happy. I said, well, what a way to be happy, shout, shout, <laughs> screaming, <laughs> carrying on like that, you know. She said, well, you know, then I heard the stories slowly from different people. Yeah, well, you know, your grandmother was abused. You see how her eyes always closed like that? Where her husband used to beat her and it beat that eye. She would just hit that eye. And your grandmother never went to, to, to uh, school because I used to get a birthday card religiously. I never missed from my grandmother every August 20th. And I always had $5 in there and she would write me a note and I would ask my mother, why is the spelling so bad? She goes, because she never went to school, but she loves you. She loves you, she loves you. That's why you get that card. And you need to call her up right now and tell her you love her. And when I would be around, she would kid, but she raised two kids on her own with nary a man there to help her. And what did she do? She went and cleaned people's houses and cooked food for them and took care of their children. And she had a house. You know why? She never let us eat out. She never let her, she ne never let my, my dad and our family take her out. She goes, no, honey, I'm cooking. I'm gonna save that money. She saved every penny. And then she bought her own house, uh, got a car, you know, stuff like that. She did have foster children sometimes and you get a little bit of money for that to do that you know to, to take care of those kids and she was able to you know, make and those kids have become great kids too um so they said she's happy she shouts like that because of what she's gone through and she feels that god has always taken care of her hmm. and i was like okay i get it now yeah i get it now and it, it, it was a music when she always shot yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that that uh, that you or or projects or um, or other things that you're uh, involved in that you that you want to uh, say something about? Yeah, well, you know, normally I would. I would tell you about um, you know the you know, I'm the the new principal pops conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony, um, and that's ex we, you know. I'm, I'm so excited to work with them. They're one of the, you know, top 10 orchestras in, in the country, if not the world, they, they tour internationally. And, um, I'm excited to work with them, but, um, what's orchestral music going to be? 
but you yeah. know, I, I'm, I'm the pops conductor. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, as I say all that, I realize, and they realize, you know, I've been going to meetings and doing things and working with them already and planned out this coming season. My first concert, official concert, we've planned a big opening. It's supposed to be in October. I don't know if that's going to happen. They have a 2000 seat hall. People are going to want to come in. 2000 people are going to want to come in there. Will a thousand, will 500, will 250, will a hundred? I don't know. The orchestra's, you know, 60, 70 pieces. And we've got music ready to go. And we've got, I've got, you know, three great shows planned with them. And then they use, you know, guest conductors for the, for the other, probably three others during the year. Um, so I'm in a holding pattern, but look, I'll just say it like this. Um, this is the time where for me, Sean, I'm on learning mode and, and betterment mode. And so that the next time people hear me, I want to be able to do what I talked to you about before is, is ignite them with the fire and the power of music. Um, yeah. Music is the, the, the highest form of, of showing love, I think, to people. Um, without music, life would be a mistake, the philosopher said, you know? And I really believe that. And I think that the healing can come as we come out of this, it can come from the musicians. And I wanna be on the front lines and I want you to be there with me of letting people experience life and let the power of music inform what they do. If they hear the love that's in there, they'll be like me. My mother used to tell me, said, son, I don't hate anybody. And I always, she used to always say that. She says, now I don't, if somebody mess with me, I still don't need to hate them. I won't let them abuse me and hurt me. But my mother talked to everybody because she said, I love everybody. See, this is the difference between, I mean, I'm not a religious guy, but my mother was. And my mother said, because that's God's teaching, you know? I'm saying, and I love people who live what they preach. And my mother was not one who said one thing and did the other. So when she said she loved everybody, she was talking to people in the grocery store. I said, Mom, why do you have to talk to everybody? She says, because I love everybody. Huh. And she would always tell people, my wife was like, is like this. She, if somebody walks by and they're beautiful, she, she can find the beauty in a bum on the street. And my wife would be in the street and she'll look at a guy in the gutter and say, you have beautiful hair, I love your, and she's serious. And that you make that person's day, you know? So I wanna become a better lover too. And my wife has taught me that. My mother taught me that, you know? Um, Music has the power to do that. And I think that's why maybe I was put here. And I, you know, look, I'll just let you know this. My, my wife's father used to say, honor the gift. So I've been given maybe a gift, but you honor it by practicing and you honor it by shaping and molding and sculpting it. Cause somebody can give you a gift. Now you can't just sit there and okay, I'm great. No, like I got to constantly shape and mold and sculpt myself into a, a great musician. That's that's my that's my lot in life. That's why I'm here. And hopefully when I leave, somebody will say, man, I heard that concert and that lifted me up. I've already ha had people say, man, your album got me through my cancer treatments. Now, if somebody says something like that, I start crying because that's why I'm here. That's really Byron. I mean, it's the Byron nobody knows, but that's really me. And thank you, you know, thank you for inviting me on here because maybe more people should know that but hopefully they feel it through the music it's like if i make people laugh which i think that's good music too um, good medicine too people are like why are you trying to be funny because that's one way i can break people down to listen to the music so if i can get you to laugh a little bit after a couple songs okay now you relax and i said now we're gonna play some felonious monk for you. you're like well i like this guy up here he makes me laugh so i'm gonna listen to felonious monk Mm. And maybe you like it and maybe you don't, but you, you learned something that time and maybe your life has been enriched in that way. So that's the real Byron. I just, I'm, I'm a, um, see, I'm disarming myself tonight. You actually made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a lover, man. I, I like my, my mother. I love everybody. If, you know, and if you'll let me love you, I'll love you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love you too. 
Oh, back at you. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, thank you so much for uh, being willing to uh, come and talk to me um, and being willing to share what you've shared. Um, Absolutely. Let me tell you something. I have to say, like I said at the beginning, I'm very inspired by who you are and what you are, and you demonstrate every time I hear you and every time you you stand on stage. Uh, when you've played with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra and you solo, everybody, you, people might not come up to you, but they come up to me. And it's like, who is that guy? You know, that that's special. Like, that's special. And that's all, that's what it's about. It's like, there's something that you do that moves them, you know? So I just want to thank you for the musician that you are. And I'm trying to get where you are, man. You were, like I said, you were a virtuoso, um, a, a world-class musician, leading a department of young people and inspiring it and lifting them up. And they see, you know, there's a, this saying by Emerson that says, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Who you are, it speaks so loud. I can't hear what you're saying. I look at what you do. So you demonstrate through your body, which I'm aware of, because you walk in and like, Sean, there's a presence there. It's just, you know, this is, this is Adonis that walks in the room and that you've got to work hard on that. Then you take out your horns and you warm up. I'm like, okay, you're just not profiling. You playing too. You know, and that's inspiring to me, too. And I think that people that are around you, they either going to resent you for that or they're like, I want some of that. And that's why I ask you those questions at the beginning of our conversation. I want to know what you do to that, because you're, you're an amazing musician, an amazing man. So thank you for being Sean. Well, thank you for being Byron. And, and uh, I'll pay you later. <laughs> God, uh, God bless you. And uh uh, be safe. Thank you, man. We'll see you next time. All right now. Okay. Bye-bye.